Well, my dear friends, the month of October is upon us already, and to celebrate this scariest of all months, I will be doing a series of anthology videos to celebrate the coming of Halloween, starting tonight with three tales of terror for your listening delight. <laughs> three more tales from Dr. Creepin's Old for you this evening, all fantastic and terrifying in their own individual ways. And I'll be doing this every week leading up to Halloween, so you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I woke to the sound of heavy banging on my door. I jolted upright from the couch I'd passed out on. Well, ever since I'd gotten pregnant, I kept falling asleep in <laughs> random places. I wasn't showing it, but I pulled on a heavy sweatshirt anyway. I'd always been self-conscious about my body. The banging got louder, and it was incessant. What the f- I mumbled, pushing my hair out of my face. I looked through the peephole to see who it was. I couldn't make it out at first. All I could see was what I assumed to be barely the top of someone's head. Who is it? Carter! It was my little sister. I didn't know what to make of the situation. The last time I'd seen her was at my medical school graduation. She'd stood all the way at the back, wearing a black parka that swallowed her whole figure. She'd raised her hand up in greeting, as I received my diploma, and then darted off without a word. She walked past me in a huff now, heading straight for the kitchen while mumbling to herself. <laughs> she hadn't changed much. The hunchback she'd developed from years of bending over her piano, her black parka, her frizzy, uncombed hair, and the huge, dark circles under her eyes. Yep, they were still all the same. Hey, long time no see. I said under my breath, lamely. You got coffee? I don't have much time. I just have to explain some things to you and give you some stuff to hold on to while I'm away, she said in that sullen voice of hers. Away? I asked, perplexed. She hadn't left her house for years, except to go get groceries. She didn't answer me. Her right hand spooned coffee into the machine while her left played a silent melody in the air. I watched her silently, as she brewed the coffee, pulled out two mugs, poured some in each cup, and then slid one over to me on the countertop. I was four years old when Mama took me to a symphony, she said quietly, cupping her mug in both hands. She'd been wearing protective gloves since her teenage years. What does that have to do with you going away? Where are you going? Why did you block my cause? Why do I always feel like my little sister hates me? I watched a pain look fleet across her sharp features. One hand immediately started doing trills in the air. It'll make sense once I explain. I just need you to promise that you'll listen to the whole story without interrupting. I need you to understand why I did what I did, she said, almost bleeding. All right, I murmured, all signs of anger leaving my body at once. The chagrin in her voice irked me. I wanted to hear what she had to say. Oh, thank you, Elena. She took off her huge parka. Its inside pockets were filled with sheet music as usual, some pencils sticking out at the top and a piano wire poking out too. She'd always been skinny, but now she had become bony. Her skin looked almost translucent while she moved, mumbling to herself the whole time. Yeah, I was four years old when Mama took me to the symphony. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Yeah, I was in awe. I couldn't pry my eyes off the stage. The sleek, black, grand piano called to me. My fingers trembled to touch its black and white keys. Do you remember when we came home that night and I crawled into bed next to you? I told you I was going to be the best pianist in the world. I nodded, remembering every second like it was yesterday. I hadn't taken her very seriously at first because, well, she was just a toddler. But the next day at the breakfast table, she brought it up again. She wanted a piano. Now, we weren't exactly a wealthy family. Our father told her we couldn't afford a new one, 
But he would ask his uncle for the one that was gathering dust in his living room. She was beaming for the rest of that day. Yeah, I know people wouldn't take me seriously, but I was convinced I would be the greatest pianist on earth. When I asked Papa for the piano and he said yes, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven once again. Oh, I remember the day it arrived, how it didn't fit in the small living room at first, so Papa decided to take all the furniture out of the room. God, I had to sit on a stack of books on the stool to reach the keys. She smiled bitterly, reminiscing. What I remembered didn't make me smile. She had never been the same after that day. She had become so completely obsessed with that damn piano. She would forget to eat, drink and sleep, and tinkered away on that thing almost all day. That's also when she started talking to herself, and becoming more and more distant from the family. When she was 16, she applied to the most reputable music school in the country. She was accepted almost immediately. She'd performed a sonata she'd written herself at the age of 14, and stunned the entire auditorium into silence. Anyway, I knew this was the only thing I wanted to do until the day I died. So, I learned, I practiced, I composed. And that's when she started talking to me, Ellie. Her voice quivered. She hadn't called me Ellie in years. She? I asked, very confused. Um, Elegy. That's what I named her after we became friends. The piano. She spoke to me. At first, it was very friendly. I started to spend so much of my time with her that I missed you. Oh. I decided to ask if I could introduce you to, and maybe you could listen to us play sometimes. That's when she got hostile. She told me nobody wanted to hear my subpar melodies. She said I needed every single second I spent with her because it was the only way I could be so good. She said she was sure that with this attitude I would fail. When I asked her why she said that, I was... When I asked her why, she said that I was not to pay any attention to distractions. I stopped talking to you altogether after that. I wanted to be great, you see. Her black eyes were brimmed with tears. She shakily lifted the cup to her lips, gulping down the contents and immediately pouring herself some more. I was feeling very numb. I hadn't moved a single muscle as I listened to her talk to me about her talking piano. I remembered all the times I would one minute find her aggressively shaking her head, yelling, No! into thin air, and the next, letting her fingers glide over the keys, playing magical melodies. I remember pleading with Father, telling him to take her to a doctor. God, she looked so sickly, and she acted in the strangest ways. Neither Mama nor Pa ever listened to me. They said that she was a genius, that, well, it was normal for her to be a little off. Everything went downhill after I got into my dream school. You don't say, I thought, careful of my facial expression. Ma and Pa had to tell her that they couldn't afford the school she wanted to go to. They'd both died within a year of that in the house fire. Mama and Papa had taken some heavy sleeping pills before bed. It was the only way they could sleep through my sister's incessant playing. Carter had woken up on the couch next to the piano. Freaked out and her first and only thought was about that piano. She never even gave a second thought to Mama and Papa. She forgot all about them, and they died in their sleep. The fireman found her in hysterics. She'd broken the window and was trying to drag her piano out. They tried to pull her away, but she was inconsolable. She screamed in agony as she watched her piano burn. Mama and Papa had died because she chose a goddamn piano over waking them up. I was plagued by nightmares when I found out I couldn't go. Elegy didn't speak to me when I was playing anymore. She told me to scrape off a small dark chunk of wood from her tail so she could be with me wherever I went. She sighed, pressing her eyeballs with her fingers. She continued. One night, I was in bed, having what I thought was a night terror. 
there was a woman standing at the front of my bed, dressed head to toe in black. God, her face was so pale, it was ghostly white. I tried to wake up, but she spoke. She told me I was already awake. It was energy. I could see her now. Not only that, but she could control my limbs, telling me how useless I am and that it would be nothing without her. She was always there, telling me. I tried to tell Mama, but she silenced me. I tried to quit playing, but she controlled me, so I was completely powerless. One night, she told me to take out a spare piano wire. She told me to go into our parents' room and... Oh, I wouldn't do it. I was banging my head against the walls, trying to get her out of my head. I was pleading, telling her to please take me instead. I saw Papa walking out of the bedroom. Oh, he seemed very groggy. He could barely walk properly. And that's when she took over. I couldn't control my limbs. I watched as she used my body to sneak up behind him, wrap the cord around his neck. And she was pulling so hard that... I could hear his throat crunching under the pressure. Once he was gone, she went into the bedroom and strangled Mama. I hadn't seen Papa's face as he died, but she made sure I was straddling Mama, watching every second of life leaving her. And then I just remember standing outside with the fireman, yelling about energy. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't think. I couldn't move couldn't make a sound. She looked at me imploringly. When I said nothing, she stood up. I will be gone for a long time. I know I have no right to ask anything of you. She mumbles. And damn right, I think. Rage boiling up inside of me. I still can't move. My sheet music. Will, you please burn it. All of it. She emphasized. I didn't say anything. I was still too shocked. She walked out the way she came in, her hump now visible that her parka wasn't covering her. She clicked the door shut, and I sat there. I just sat there for hours, trying to comprehend and failing. By the time the sun rose again, I managed to get up out of my seat. Oh, that goddamn Parker was still where she'd left it. Years of being worn and not being washed once. It looked extremely coarse. I was furious. I was going to give her the Parker and tell her to burn it her goddamn self. Then I was going to call the police and turn her in. It was heavy as I stuffed it into a duffel bag, along with its crumpled contents. I drove way above the speed limit, thinking everything over in my head. Tears streaming down my face. I came to a halt in front of her house. I was crying uncontrollably by this point. I banged my fist on her door repeatedly. No answer. I tried the doorknob and it was unlocked. I stormed inside, expecting to find her sitting on that stool like she always was. She was nowhere to be seen. She must have left already. I threw the duffel bag on the floor. How could she commit such a heinous crime and get to get away with it? I was beyond furious. I kept pacing up and down the bare-floored main room. I was trying not to look at that damn piano. I remembered that I had a shovel in my trunk. I'd bought it ages ago because I needed a hobby and decided on gardening. I'd been driving around with it in the back seat for four years. I rushed out and ripped the trunk open, forcefully grabbing the shovel. The rage was boiling inside me. I ran back inside. The shovel raised above my head, and I struck the damn thing. Over and over, I kept striking with the shovel, but other than a couple of small dents, I couldn't cause damage. Fine, I thought. I'll break it from the inside. I opened the heavy top and froze. <gasps> what the f... It was cut. She was curled up in the fetal position, completely naked. Her body was covered with old burn marks. Her hands a completely different shade of white from the rest of her body because of the gloves she'd been wearing for almost two decades. 
Her black eyes were lifeless. A piano wire was wrapped around her neck tightly. And that's when I heard her low chuckle. She's next. I looked behind me, and nobody was there. There was no way it was this damn piano speaking. Who's there? I half screamed, clutching my tiny pregnant belly. Suddenly, piano keys started moving on their own, playing Chopin's funeral march. I bolted to the car, my pulse ringing in my ears. That night in bed, I had a nightmare. There was a woman dressed all in black. Her face and hair were completely white. She smiled, and I wanted to scream. Her teeth were black and white, like a keyboard. Her teeth moved up and down like piano keys as she spoke, but she only said one single sentence. She will be mine. I'm a kleptomania. Top that off with compulsive lying, an obsessive curiosity, and a cluttered ADHD mind, then you'll have summarized my childhood. When I was seven, I stole my friend's favorite toy because I wanted it. Neither he, nor his parents for that matter, ever found it. It felt good, like I'd earned the right to have it. Ever since then, I've grown addicted to the impulses. My parents had no clue about it. Anything outside of their jobs was just white noise. Now, I don't only take expensive items. So-called worthless items are fair game as well. Things that you may not ever realize are gone. I've become exceptionally good at picking locks, too. Stealing was and has always been a way of life for me. And I was good at never being caught. That is, until one day, when the black cloud of karma I had accumulated over the years caught up with me. I stole something I shouldn't have. I mean, something I really shouldn't have. Something that still keeps me up at night questioning what I'd actually seen. So, what did I steal? A laptop. One I found at a coffee shop. I was waiting in line for a much-needed shot of espresso. It was pouring cats and dogs outside, and the grey skies, coupled with the rhythmic pattering, was causing me to nod off. I took a seat closest to the window, listening to the rain slap against the outer glass. The shop was relatively empty that day, not many souls filling the seats. I caught sight of something on the table across from mine. A closed laptop, just sitting there. The other customers were not seated near me and were conversing with each other. Maybe the owner was in the bathroom. I waited around just to be sure, but there was still no sight of them. That familiar urge began to pester me. I tapped my finger incessantly on the table. If the owner had forgotten about it, oh, that was their fault, wasn't it? Can't blame a fox for stealing your chickens if you don't put up a fence. Nothing personal. It's just how the world works. <laughs> Welcome to the food chain. I gave a cursory glance at the mounted surveillance cams. I'd become fairly adept at identifying the blind spots. The laptop table was located directly beneath one of them, ideally out of its line of sight. I stood up and nonchalantly approached the table as though I was heading into the restroom. Passing it, I scooped up the laptop, stuffed it beneath my arm, and quickly headed out the door. My heart was throbbing in my chest. Even if the camera had caught the act, then so what? It would just be another place I wouldn't be returning to, which is the reason I stayed away from credit cards and, well, always paid in cash. I drove off with my catch. <sighs> another good day to be alive. When I got home, I checked over the laptop, it was sleek, one of the newer models. Possibilities competed in my head. <sighs> Should I keep it for myself? Should I sell it for some extra cash? 
Regardless, I would have to completely wipe it. But first, well, why not take a peek? I booted up the laptop, expecting to be stopped by an account PIN or some cryptic password. But it opened directly to the desktop. The wallpaper was a dull grey sheet with a few internet browsing icons, including Tor. Well, well, I thought to myself. Looks like someone likes to visit the dark web. The folder sat in the lower corner of the screen, with a series of numbers and capitalized letters beneath it. I guessed it must have been a code, or perhaps some complete gibberish. Anyway, out of curiosity, I clicked on it. A folder opened in a program called Folder Padlock 2.0 that gave me something to fill out. I will never tell a... Dash, dash, dash. I shook my head. Was this a joke? If this was their idea of airtight security, then maybe they should steer clear from the unforgiving world of the dark web. Some more food for thought. Maybe you don't put your password-protected folder on your desktop. But perhaps it's to be expected of someone who left their laptop unattended like they did. Shrugging to myself, I filled in the blanks. I will never tell her L-I-E. <laughs> the answer worked, obviously, and I was connected to some sort of website. The folder must have acted as a shortcut to it. Uh, more specifically, it took me to the site's link archive page. Written at the top of the page, in bold red letters, was the following. Book of Cleansing. Unburden your neighbours. Absolve them from sin. Each individual link of garbled code was uploaded by a different user. You could tell by the various usernames attached to them. The page suddenly shifted. A new link had just been added to the top. The screen name next to it was Matthew 1918. I hovered the cursor over the link and clicked it open. A video popped up and immediately started playing. The lights were dim, and I could hear the sound of footsteps, sets of them walking over a hard floor. Behind the graininess, I could make out the silhouette of a man. He was walking through a poorly lit hallway, whistling a cheery tune that echoed off the walls. Whoever held the camera was lingering behind him. They approached a door and pushed it open. Centered in the room was a woman on a table lying on her stomach. She was naked, tied down by restraints around her wrists and ankles. Hovering over the small of her bare back was some kind of examination light, the kind a hospital would have. The woman let out a muffled groan. It sounded like she was gagged. The whistling man approached her and knelt down to her level while the camera came around. Now that he was closer to the light, I could get a clearer picture of him. He wore a black suit, a maroon tie, and vividly white gloves. He had long black hair, straight down to his shoulders. Both of his rosy cheeks were dimpled by the broad smile stretched across his face. He placed several fingers beneath the woman's chin and lifted her face up. The camera zoomed in for a closer look. A leather harness was strapped around her head that had covered her mouth. Her visible eyes and eyebrows were contorted with fear. Tears dribbled out of them, carrying black streaks of makeup all down and around her cheeks. Her left eye was swollen and nearly closed shut. Deep horizontal lines creased the bridge of her nose. A reflective glaze of sweat glistened on her skin beneath the bright light. My first impression was that I'd stumbled upon some bondage snuff film, but something felt off. There was something much more sinister behind it. That look of crystallized fear on the woman's face bothered me. It felt too real to be an act. Despite my growing uneasiness, I couldn't stop myself watching. Another dull moan escaped from the woman. There, there, the man said in a soft, soothing voice. I know you're scared, but we're in this together, okay? The woman's trembling head slowly nodded. Good. The man trilled with that sickeningly broad smile. 
Before we start, please try to understand something. No matter what may come of this, it is for the sake of your wellness. He then stood up and paced around the table, examining the woman's exposed body. Promptly, he stopped, looked squarely at the camera, and then pointed at the lower back. The camera focused on that area. Tattooed on her lower back was a small bird spreading its wings. He shook his head in disappointment and rested a hand over his mouth. A deep sigh slipped through his white fingers, followed by the click of his tongue. This is unfortunate, but necessary. His voice had a new gravity carrying it. You've fallen prey to outside influences, allowing them to pollute your mind. He paused a moment, tracing the unblemished skin surrounding the tattoo, as well as your body. With a small gesture, the person holding the camera appeared to hand him something out of frame. An inked body, the long-haired man continued, is no longer a temple of God. But don't worry, we will fix this sin. We will fix this tainted flesh. We will fix this, because only we can. He rested his hand firmly against the quivering spine. You must be strong now, okay? Be strong for me. The placid softness had returned to his voice. The object in his hand glinted with a bar of light. It was a scalpel. My heart rate skyrocketed. What was he doing? The person handling the camera maneuvered around once again, providing a clear view. The small, sharp knife was held obliquely to the tattoo. In one smooth motion, it slid into her skin. She let out a guttural screech, stifled by the harness, until it rasped. Her body convulsed on the table, with her restrained arms and legs writhing uselessly. I gasped, watching as the knife moved through the widening slit in her lower back, slicing through flesh and in a repression of doubt inside of me, tried to dismiss it as fake. But those sounds of agonized pain were not staged. The white glove wielding the scalpel worked carefully, wiping away excess blood, making precise cuts and holding the knife tightly, but steadily as it flayed in the flesh. It was like he had done it countless times before. During all of this, behind the woman's desperate screams, I could hear him actually comforting her. It's okay. Be strong. I know, I know. Almost done. The knife eventually reached the last bit of connective tissue and scraped through it. A raw, pink crater was left on her back. This sick asshole held the grisly flap of tattoo skin up to the camera and walked off with it. While he was gone, the camera panned back to the woman's face. Weak, deep belly sobs came out of her. She sucked in ragged breaths. I felt nauseated. What kind of monster would do this to someone? The long-haired man came back and knelt beside her. I swear to God, I've never hated a smile more than the one stretched over that man's face. It was still so disgustingly cheery. The tainted flesh is gone, he said with a prolonged sigh of relief. Don't worry, we'll take care of that wound. But first, we have another matter to attend to. A weird sound followed, like something being unzipped. Now we must decontaminate the temple. He began to slip off his pants. I shut the video off. I couldn't handle it anymore. Fake or not, the concept alone was absolutely disgusting. Did all of the links on this page include videos like this one? Whoever had owned this laptop definitely had a sick taste. I couldn't wait to wipe it clean of all its disgusting data. A chime suddenly came from the laptop. Some kind of chat box had appeared on the screen. I hadn't even clicked off the website yet. I read the message. Goosebumps sprouted all over me. The user who sent it was Matthew1918. Stealing is a sin, you know. That was my breaking point. 
I slammed the damn thing shut and drove it as fast as I could back to the coffee shop. I told the cashier that I'd mistakenly taken it as my own. She'd said they'd keep it in their lost and found for the owner. That bastard. I couldn't sleep for weeks after that. The laptop had been planted there on purpose. That much was evident. How else did Matthew 1918 know that I'd stolen it? What if they watched me take it from the coffee shop? What if they used it to trace my address? What if their next plan was to break into my house and film another skinning? Then I'd end up as another link for that horrible sight. Thankfully, nothing came of it. But I couldn't help think that I'd dodged a bullet. It's been three months now, and I haven't stolen anything since. For me, that's a significant milestone. Whenever the itch finally comes back, I start to remember that woman screaming. Nothing will help me get that out of my head. I can only blame myself for ending up in that position. For anybody else out there who's interested in surfing the dark web, maybe consider this as an alternative. Steer fucking clear. I've never experienced anything of the paranormal kind. I don't know if it's because I have trouble believing that the dead can linger after their physical departure from our world or not, but I have tried to trigger responses. You know, to test the waters. Breaking rules of Ouija boards and going into haunted, abandoned places. And yet, nothing out of the ordinary has ever happened. I've heard stories from relatives and friends who've had close encounters with entities not of our world. All of their stories are different and, well, hard to believe in. I'm still a skeptic lying in wait until something proves otherwise. Now, I'm not sure if what's been happening to me is related to all of the sketchy shit I love doing, or if it's entirely psychological and, well, I'm in need of help. Now, this work of writing is all relatively true. My family and I had gone on a vacation a few weeks ago to a small resort in Tampa, Florida. A smallish resort to spend time together before I head back off to university. I spend a lot of my nights writing, reading, or listening to stories that'll probably never happen to me. Just horrifying true stories, or relentless short works of fiction. All of them graphic, and all of them part of a niche that I'm in love with. On the second to last night, there I was listening to some of these stories while sitting on the balcony that was part of our fifth story suite. I had all of this energy, but I can't put my finger on what this pit growing in my stomach was. When I came inside to sleep on the pull-out couch I'd chosen instead of one of the beds in the rooms, the temperature was cool, but... Not like in those movies where you can see your breath or whatnot. Anyway, wrapped in a blanket, I struggled to fall asleep. I wish I had more words to describe the feeling of being watched, but, well, it was just that. This was the first time in my 18 years alive I'd experienced what I understand to be sleep paralysis. I don't know how to explain this comprehensively, so I'm going to ramble in this next part. To my understanding, after experiencing this phenomena, you wake up, but it's only your mind. I couldn't move my body, and when I did try, it felt agonizing. My anxiety hadn't really risen, because I'd heard of stuff like this. But I did forget the part about the hallucinations, though. Describing this is where the relative truth comes into play, because, well, if I'm being honest... I'm still very confused about what I saw. I was laying on my stomach. I only had half of my face I was able to see. There was this tingling sensation. And then I thought I saw a woman. She was dressed in a short, flowy white gown. She smiled and then said some inaudible words to me. But I can't remember for the life of me what she said. Now, oh, this next part is traumatic and has me shook on this whole scenario. The woman drove her hand into my chest, and the pain, even if it was in my head, oh, it was agony. 
I suffered for what seemed like hours. She kept going and shoving. I felt a burning sensation in my chest, which I can only assume was my heart pounding. I tried to move, to run, to get away from her as fast as I could, and as far as I could, but all my effort was in vain. And this was one of the most painful things that has ever happened to me. I woke up fully, eventually. But it wasn't the last time that this sleep paralysis has happened to me. The following weeks were nothing extraordinary. Seeing a concert with my friends that featured logic was the highlight between grabbing dinner and sleeping between my work shifts. Yeah. The second case of sleep paralysis occurred one day. Oh, I don't remember the exact time or date, so bear with me. And it was far different to the first case. It wasn't violent, but, but I believe that if I hadn't done what I did, it well could have been. So, I was lying in bed and had been like dead asleep for hours when I felt the same tingling sensation from before. I started to get anxious because I didn't want to go through the same trauma as the previous time. So I tried to move my hands to push myself onto my stomach to hide from, well, what could possibly be there. It was painful. No, no, it was agonizing trying to override my sleeping brain and to move my limbs as I wanted to. I did, and it was just as painful if not more so than experiencing the woman drive her hand deep into my chest. Once I'd laid on my belly, facing away from my closet, and making sure I had a box in front of my face so I couldn't see, oh, but this nightmare wasn't over. I was hearing the voice of the woman cooing to me, attempting to coax me into coming with her. When I didn't answer, she quickly became angered and irate. I heard crashing noises and screams, all hallucinations, but at the same time I felt she was going after my family, and I cried myself to sleep in the never-ending nightmare that I couldn't fully escape from. Next morning, everything was normal in my house. I asked my family if they were okay, and they just looked at me, puzzled. I asked if they'd heard anything from my room the night before, and they all said no as well. Okay. Well, I'm happy that everyone's safe. But I don't know if this was the last time it would happen to me or not. All I can do is hope. Three brilliant stories for you there. Hope you enjoyed all of those. Comments in the section below the video as always and I'll do my best to reply and have a little chat with you. Feeling a bit down, a bit ill at the moment and very busy with work but hey, I enjoy chatting with you so I'll do my best to uh, get involved in the comments as always. Well, back again on Friday. Hope I see all of you then. Well, of course I will. You'll be back, won't you? Yes, <laughs> indeed you will. Okay, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>